Hey, what's up everybody? It's Thursday, April 21st, and this is an Ask Me Anything video. So um, a lot of times during track feedback, questions come up about how I do something or how other people do something, and we don't always have time during track feedback to answer those questions. So I wanted to build a little space, we can do that. And I put up a post in Facebook to collect questions and I asked on email, so we got some good questions. The main thing we're gonna talk about is how I DJ with Ableton Live, which I'll show you in my Ableton setup and describe what I'm doing on the analog mixer. And before we do that, for anybody who's have a burning desire to know, Matt Schultz, Cafe Bustelo. This is what I drink. The reason is it's like an espresso grind. It's super good. I just like the way it tastes. And I mix cinnamon with the coffee grounds to get my hyper volcano charge of caffeine that you see me drinking in all these. Question, uh, how do you DJ with Ableton? We're gonna answer that. Question, do you have workflows you never change? If so, which ones? Yes, absolutely. So the number one workflow that I never change is when I'm in my creative mode, I'll open a session and just drop new audio audio channels, new MIDI channels, throw in new instruments and have this random wild orgy of designing sounds and, and instruments. Because I just imagine a sound I wanna hear when I'm listening to a beat and I think I need a lead, it, it feels like this, I'm gonna find that sound. And then I just drop a MIDI instrument, I might grab a sampler or a, a wavetable or an analog synth or something. And I just create the sound from my imagination. That's the most important thing. Later, after I've built up all the beats, all the rhythms, all the synths and sounds and everything, then I go to another workflow, which is the organizing section where I take things and put them into groups, group my drums, group my instruments, create my buses of stereo groups and get into mix mode, which absolutely has a process from start to finish that I can teach you in my basic mixing course. That's more than I can describe in one session. But the basic point is that my workflows are like, number one, wild creativity with no limits, get sounds from anywhere in the world that they come from, including accidents and stuff. And then phase two is the mix down, which is a much more organized process of measuring, adjusting, doing your gain staging, getting your effects and routing so that you have a technical mix, which is gonna sound really good and represent all those creative ideas effectively. So that's my basic workflow. Get wild first, mix it down proper, and get it done. Now, um, have you ever considered moving back to Europe? Yes, I miss my friends in Prague all the time. I think about it all the time. I'm definitely gonna be doing some traveling. What I would love to do eventually is become a truly global citizen and be able to go to outdoor festivals all around the world, almost like spending a month in every different country where somebody's doing something and be part of the production and the creation and performing and teaching and like doing stuff at these events and have a traveling thing and then also create a home base for that with uh you know a little organic farm and solar power and animals and all that kind of thing i mean everybody would love to live with nature and have sound systems and laptops and internet and travel around and visit each other like if we could all do that that would be a great life <laughs> have you used other daws than ableton and if yes what made me choose ableton okay so my first daw was the mpc 2000 which was a standalone freestanding one uh, i worked with pro tools and logic when i was in music school which were okay. Pro Tools was good for technically learning about multi-track recording. Logic was great for the MIDI implementation before Ableton existed, but Logic is still only kind of the arrangement view. And I stuck with Ableton specifically put because of session view. That is the number one reason that Ableton is so exemplary in the world of DAWs, is that you can do everything in your arrangement and time-based stuff using scenes in session view, which actually we're gonna look at in, uh, in the DJ set and you can get your loops and your layers and your sequences or song sections and everything all built in session view and then literally play them live to get a timeline of the stuff that happens. So that's, session view is basically why I chose live. Question, are you educated in music or are you autodidact? Uh, first five years, definitely autodidact. I went from playing guitar and smoking weed, working in kitchens to working on the MPC, learning how to record on a cassette deck, learning how to mix on vinyl with a DJ mixer. All those things I just learned by doing it. Then I went to music school in 99 and learned music theory, formal signal flow and electrical, you know, interconnecting electrical equipment in the audio studio and MIDI and synthesizers from hardware and mics and stereo mic techniques and all this stuff of production I learned in the music school with also harmonic analysis, chord progressions, singing in the choir, playing piano in the piano practice room and everything. So yeah, I definitely went through the music school program. That was at the Sonic Arts Center at City College of New York. Graduated 2003 with a fine arts degree and it definitely changed my life to give me the skills to describe what I'm hearing and find problems in harmony or rhythm or timing and just get better tools to use for production instead of getting stuck with a feeling of how I want the music to sound and not being able to get that sound, which is um, when I was learning just fooling around at home. A lot of times I wanted something to change and I knew it didn't feel right, but I didn't know how to make it feel right. And I didn't have the technical skills to bridge that gap. 
Ian Waters, good question. Do you make the music you really like or do you make it for the audience and it's not from the heart? I make the music I really like 100% of the time. Uh, there have been times I made music that I didn't really want to do, like like audio for a soundtrack for a commercial or something, and I just had to make it sound good for their standards. And that's not what I'm all about. I've always steered away from that. In fact, I got a residency one time where um, at Chapeau Rouge in Prague and the downstairs downstairs, and I talked to the booking guy, Daniel, and he went like this, and he goes, on the spectrum from commercial to experimental, where is your music? And I was like, over here, experimental. Not meaning noise or sound or fucked up audio, but just meaning like it's all original. And I like bass lines and beats and things that make people happy and people dance to. So house music, I mean, I want my tracks to sound as good as commercially successful club tracks, but in an original style and I do the music that I feel. So I do a lot of different tempos and a lot of like, kind of like stuff that's not within the rules of the genre, but I like it that way. So that's what I do. And um, it works for me for when I was playing live all the time and DJing all the time, I always was able to bring the audience into the vibe with my tracks, unless I got booked at completely the wrong venue. And then I just had to play what they wanted to hear. And that's, those are not my favorite gigs. So um, thanks for the questions. Oh, geez, I was looking at the list on the Facebook poll, so I didn't hit, say hey to everybody. So Pivclit, answer your question. Maxine, what's up? DJ Waters, ask me anything. Comments on uh, using logic. And DJ Waters, yes, I am naked from the waist down actually right now. Um, I'm standing up to my waist in this like bathtub of warm water with a whole bunch of naked people swimming around underneath it around my legs. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. That's not true. All right, let's get into um, how to DJ with Ableton Live. So thank you for waiting for that seven minute life story. Super fascinating. First thing is um, I got two decks and for the audio, I'm going out stereo pairs, seven and eight and nine and 10. Those go to two channels on my analog mixing board because I want to control volume, mute, and the three band EQ on the board. So when I'm playing a track, all these kinds of things that you do as a DJ, I don't want to, um, I don't want to have to try and set up controllers and map three knobs for my high, mid, and low EQ, and then map three knobs for the other deck and map a crossfader. Like you can do that really easily on some devices, but anytime you have to think of moving the cursor to activate a control is an extra step that gets in the way. So I really like having the analog controls. So if I want to simultaneously cut the bass on one track and boost the bass on another track, here's one track. And let's say I'm getting to mix in the new track, right? I can take the new track, cut the bass instantly, and fade it up. Then I can switch the bass with EQ and do it really seamlessly and fluidly just by mixing with feel. Being able to put your hands on the board and EQ stuff and use the volume faders really is the heart of DJing. So I always wanna have that as a very tactile control. Nothing is gonna separate that connection. Like no matter what I do on the screen or where I put this selector field or the blue hand or the mouse or whatever, nothing is gonna disconnect my EQs. And I've had DJ sets where I tried doing it the other way. With these, I would have two LPDs and have like one per deck or something like that. And no matter how carefully I set it up and how much I practiced, there was always a time when like a sound would go missing and it was because I had a low pass filter all the way down and I couldn't see it and I couldn't see by the knob position what was stopping the sound. And I'd be freaking out, like dropping a track, trying to mix it. And it was something that was kind of not supposed to happen that was getting in the way. Um, getting a good balance between storytelling and groove, yeah. Oh, you guys are talking about production, yeah. So um, it's really important to me to have a physical touch on the board. And that also adds in working with an analog mixer so I can have a mic plugged in or a mic set up for a soloist on sax or trumpet or something that goes really well with the music I'm playing or a mic pointed down for the hand drummers to play along. So I got really into the groove of using an analog mixer for my DJ mixer and routing Ableton to go out two different separate decks. Uh, I'll talk about the effects in a second. Let me just look at um, what key commands we have set up. There are a bunch of controls that I do. So let's look at, um, first, there's this invisible control panel. You might not know there's a, there are controls for this, but you can see I'm moving the scene selector up and down. And I even have a button to launch tracks from the keyboard. And 
And that's really fun because sometimes you want to put your hands, you have you might have your hand near the mouse and you want to launch a track. So to enter that, I got I went into key mapping mode and look above the master channel, these little buttons appear. And I'll delete my mapping so you can see there's play button for all scenes, stop all scenes, select up and down. So I just map some little buttons for that. And then there's this window, you can map a knob and scroll up and down if you have a really big set. So now I have my little brackets to go up and down and go through scenes. I can play a global all stop if I want to. But I like to have a, a scene launch button on the keyboard keys. So look, when I enter mapping mode, right above the send section appears this little triangle, a little play button. I put the letter Q and W. Now I can launch any clip in a specific scene one by one. So I can go through here, got that coming in. One, two, three, four, two. And launch, oh, I messed up the start. Stop that. I wanna play this track. One, two, three, four. And you can get in the groove and lock the tracks together. By the way, I, it, it kind of goes without saying, before you get to this stage, you got to go in and warp all your tracks so they're so you know what BPM they're playing at so that Ableton can take the audio and scooch it onto the metronome and lock the beats in and beat match with what you're doing before. So you got to warp all your tracks before you can beat, beat match and DJ with live. Now, um, the keyboard on the Mac is not the only place to control. I also like to have uh, my push set up. So I'm in the layout in session mode. So I should really show this on camera, but on push, I've got just the, the view in the grid where I can see each clip and I can just press a button to launch whatever track I want, which gives me a really easy control where I can be on push, launch a track, I can go up and down, I can hold down the layout button and move through my set and see all the different kind of subgenres. So if I was doing a DJ night, I would be like, oh, Octavio, okay, so these are gonna be deep house tracks. This might be some techno for later, later. Up here is the opening stuff that's more like start off the night slower or whatever. And I can move through like basic zones in the set and figure 10 tracks per hour, including the mixing overlap and everything. And then I just have deck one and deck two. And notice that the tracks are all alternating. So there's empty space. So if I play something and it's not the right track, I can easily stop it right away. That's not, that doesn't work. If all your tracks are tight in a block like this, if I play this one and then suddenly I want to stop it, I'm like, oh shit, I'm launching the next one. Like, what do I do? And it can be hard to stop the track when it's the wrong track at the wrong moment. So you want to be able to start and you want to be able to stop really easily under control. I'm still burning out on the music you buy, yeah. <laughs> DJ Waters making mellow jams. I don't know, the world is changing. So those are the basic controls I'm using. Um, I have a, another little pad controller that's like this one that's down here. So I've got buttons to control up and down scenes. Again, I enter the MIDI mapping mode. This time I'm in blue, MIDI mapping. And on these buttons, I want to control scene up with this pad, scene down with this pad. And there's something really important that I like to be able to select, which is when the tracks are playing, I want to see how much time is left in the track, like the waveform itself. So let me get two tracks going. Not going to train wreck it. So here's the situation. Let's say, um, let's say I'm playing this track. And I know I'm in this build-up section. I want to know when to launch the next track. And I want to see that, right? One, two, three, four. And that tells me when to launch the next one. But if you're over here looking at your effects unit, there isn't a real easy way to see the waveform instantly until you map one special button, which is another one that appears kind of secretly. When I open MIDI mapping mode, right where the time, where the loop countdown thing is or where the time bar is, that shows you track status. I believe that's the name of the track status. So the, key, the, the button is E1. Yeah, deck one, track status, deck two, track status. When you map a button or a key to that control, it pulls up the waveform of what you're doing. So you can have two tracks playing at the same time and compare where they are. And I usually really look at this like when I'm kind of near the end of a track, right? And I'm thinking, when am I gonna launch the next one? I wanna make sure I have enough room in the track left before I you know, start making the mix. 
So I can look at that, look back at this one, say, oh, that's at the beginning. And then start the mix so that I know the 16 bars or the 32 bars are gonna be lined up, meaning the new beat is gonna drop at the right time when the old beat is ending. Let me know if that makes sense, because that's a pretty important one. Mapping this control field for the track status is super helpful. And you might notice also, um, while you're in the track status, sometimes you want to cut a loop. And that loop switches off. So I map some controllers to uh, be able to cut a little loop on the fly. Sometimes you want to loop the last two bars of the track or the last eight bars of a track so that you could mix in a new song on top. So to get there, enter mapping mode again in the looping section. I have one pad controller for the loop on off, one for the loop position that starts the start marker, and then one for the length that tells you how long the loop is going to be. And that way, when we're at the end of the track, you can cut a loop. Or if you want to loop the intro and have a longer time to use this sound mixing in on top of a new track, and then maybe cut out the lows, right? So now I got one whole track in on deck two, and I looped the intro of deck one, which I can see over there. And a lot of times I loop intros like this if I'm um, harmonic mixing on the fly. And you can have some really cool tracks. Some cool mixes by changing the pitch of a loop to get it locked in on the same note while you're mixing. DJ Water says that looks more like hard work than flipping a track in Serato and beat matching it to a fashion. Well, yeah, if you got Serato hooked up in vinyl decks and controllers and you just do it that way, um, live works really well when you have your tracks warped and you want to be working with not just mixing two tracks like DJing, but kind of creating new situations with like more than two decks or adding live elements or adding acapella samples or something or resampling live on the fly, which we can look at with controllers. So, so far I'm showing you the basic setup of how I start and stop tracks, how I make mixes using analog controls on the board and some uh, MIDI controllers to just get my hand in the right place that I want when I want it. Matt Schultz woke up, yeah. So what is it, 12, 18? That was like a 10 minute lesson on how to DJ with live. Now, if you're really interested in what else I'm doing, you can see I have an effects through that I took uh, one input on my mixer. I set up an analog send off the board. Coming in on six, this channel that it's coming in through, this effects through is just an audio channel to take the audio input from the physical board to a digital input into Ableton. Now the send is up all the way on send A, and A is an effects unit. So this is how I get an analog microphone like this coming into a digital effects in live. Then I've got a macro rack with eight knobs so I can change sounds and get little fun things to play with in the set. So just like that, I took my voice, put it into a delay feedback, cranked up the feedback. I used a filter. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Auto filter after the effect. So I used echo to get a really long delay happening with more than 100% feedback. So the feedback was self creating more sound. Put a filter on there to cut off some of the highs. And then I cranked up an LFO on the filter, 
with that cool sawtooth wave to make it go like wow, wow, wow to get that pulsing thing and totally morph the sound from one thing into something else, which can give you endless fun with transitions. You take one of those sounds that you had on loop and put it into the effects and you can start creating whole new universes of sound. For example, we got this loop, right? So I could, for example, let me show you what I'm setting up in the effects. I was looking at the effects on push. And just like I have a button for controlling how to see the track status of the waveform, I also mapped a MIDI controller to this effects rack. MIDI mapping mode, click on the top of the device and hit a pad controller so that I can see the status of my effects unit because when you're tweaking effects, you can hear it, but sometimes you can't quite see. What you, sometimes you can't hear what's wrong. Like right there, I had the filter all the way down. Matt Schultz question, do you beat match those tracks? Are you asking me? I, um, I set everything on, on global quantize so all the tracks are gonna launch according to whatever quantization intervals up at the top and then they're all warped. So in the tracks, they are set to fire along with whatever global setting I have. And that's basically how you beat match. So you don't have to, we could talk about beat matching raw tracks with um, metronome and live in a second. Let me just finish what I was saying about effects where we've got So I wanted to see the effects unit. Make some. And now what I'm doing is uh, muting the channel on the analog board, unmuting it to send some sound into the delay, and then letting the delay continue on top of the other track. So that's a cool way to get some depth and texture in your tracks is looping a little piece of one track, putting it up into the effects unit and letting that echo on top of the other track. You can use that at the end of a song to echo the last little piece over the new track that's coming in. Or you can use it at the beginning to kind of make sure your harmonic, your tuning is correct when you're getting a track like, it's already beat matched, but you want to get it pitched to the right pitch, up or down one step or something. Uh, more like the sync function in Tractor. Um, a little bit. This looks complicated. Well, you gotta make the leap to an analog mixer, really, because if you're using live with a DJ mixer, what you would do is take your audio interface, send it out to two different channels on a DJ mixer, and play that way, if you have the cables for that, which can also work fine. Just two quarter inch cable outputs to two RCA uh, DJ mixer inputs. And I mean, I've done tons of DJ gigs with no analog mixer, no push, no controllers or whatever, just with these buttons going up and down. And I'd have my outputs like, this goes out one and two. This goes out three and four. I have cables going directly to the DJ mixer and I mix on the DJ mixer with just my laptop on a stand going up and down like this with keyboard controls to launch tracks, select tracks I'm gonna play and stop them. That is the core of basic mixing with live. Now, if I'm playing with Ableton with a vinyl DJ and I wanna beat match to like a drum and bass set or whatever they're playing on vinyl, you can totally do that too. You need a couple more controllers. So I map a tap tempo with a T and then the nudge buttons with Z and X, so that when I'm listening to what the other person's playing, um, I can tap the tempo and find the exact tempo, launch one of my tracks, which is warped, and then use the nudge function to pull it into play. So to demonstrate that, let's take this track and unwarp it, right? So coming out of deck two right now, imagine that what you're hearing right now from deck two is a person playing a vinyl record on like channel four of a Pioneer Mixer. And I'm jacked in on channels one and two. And I gotta come in, this is their last track. I have to come in, plug in, set up, power on, uh, beat match, get synced, and launch a track to mix in on top of their music before the track runs out. That's what happens when you walk into the booth. You got a square meter in three minutes. <laughs> so the first thing I'm gonna do is 
listen and tap, right? And now I'm tapping tempo along with this unwarped audio and I'm praying that I get it right because you're not going to have anybody to help you. <laughs> if you're trying to beat match with live, nobody's going to be able to do anything else. You might want to turn on the metronome, which uh, in this situation, I would have the metronome coming up in my headphones only, not through the main mixer, obviously. Now you can see the power of these two little nudge functions. What I'm doing is um, slowly shifting the tempo a little bit to keep the metronome beat matched with this other track. And I'm gonna guess it's at a solid 116. The tempo is drifting, so. And it's hard because you have to get the tempo at the right number and then also aligned at the right click. So it's like the downbeat is on the downbeat, which is where the nudge buttons come in. Now that I think I have it pretty close, I'm gonna prep my other track. I cut the low EQ, let's turn off the metronome and see what happens when I launch another track. So now you can hear the Eleanor Rigby track, the green one, is on this pulse. And my new one is coming in because I have live playing at 115 BPM, which I think is what that one's at. And that'll get me close enough to be able to beat match in. And I still have to nudge a little bit to keep it like tightly synced. Here's our metronome is still pretty locked in. And eventually at the right moment. Sped it up too much a train wreck a little bit. So let me know if that makes sense. What we did, if you want to DJ using live to beat match with someone else, even doing back to back or every other record, what you need to be able to do is tap tempo and get it pretty precise. You're going to need uh, nudge buttons to scooch. And these nudge buttons, the longer you hold them down, the more it changes. It's a lot like dragging your finger on the label of a record or grabbing the spindle when the turntable is spinning. If you just touch it, it like slows a little bit. But if you pinch the spindle hard, it's going to like almost stop the record. Or if you want to speed up with the nudge, like when you put your finger on the label and you kind of scooch it. Or some people go on the edge of the turntable on the platter and do this like frisbee motion to speed it up just a little bit. That's what these nudge buttons are like. Um, what are you guys talking about? Friday night? No. Am I the only one missing Steve's miss section on Friday night? No. Wait, are you asking me to do a DJ set on Friday night? That's a good idea. <laughs> I like that idea too. I miss doing that actually. There's um a lot of things that it's hard to juggle how many live things I could do. But anyway, so what I really want to really want to focus on for this one last little section is that you absolutely can DJ with Ableton using two deck outputs going into a Pioneer mixer and mix with other people on CDJs or vinyl and have a totally seamless, world-class, perfect set if you just get a couple of things in place first. The number one thing is definitely you have to warp your tracks. You have to know your tracks so you know which one emotionally is going to fit the style of the track that you're mixing into. I mean, those things are basically go without saying. But once you have tracks tightly warped, and it helps a lot to put in warp markers at the major song sections. Like in this track, you could pretty much click each warp marker and you could even see like, here's the intro, there's the first big drop, there's a breakdown, there's another drop, there's a breakdown. And there's like a warp marker, especially at the end. It's really important to have the last 32 bars of the track really warped tightly because that's where you're going to be mixing in the new track. And if these downbeats are off the warp marker, no matter how tight your other track is, Ableton is going to be mixing the other one onto something that's not warped properly. So the beginning of the track and the end of the track are the most important parts to have the warping really, really tight. The first 32 bars and the last 32 have to be like exactly on the click. What happens in the middle doesn't really matter so much because most of the time you, you, you should have an idea that you're going to play through the middle continuously and then not mix until the end. So uh, that's, that's the, the basic layout. And if you want to have three decks or four decks or whatever, 
you could add more in live. It's just a question of having available analog channels splitting out from your audio interface to mix with. Now, this is a kind of cool situation that I have for my sound card. I have a Soundcraft mixing board that's got a lot of inputs and outputs. I can set up stereo pairs for like six, six decks if I wanted to. And then I can touch all those channels. And I can also set up multiple audio inputs. So I could have like two or three effects units where I'm taking sounds from live, going out by touching them, tweaking a knob to touch them, and have that go to the effects unit and control all those things on the board. Maxime, oh, it was fun because I played tracks from the group so we could see our tracks in another context. Yeah, I think that was my favorite part too, is um, playing tracks from people who produced one track and then their reactions were like, oh my God, I never thought that track would go in a set with this other stuff. And I was like, oh, I thought that's what you meant the whole time. And they're like, no way, it was cool. Yeah, all right, well, that's, that's great feedback from you guys. I would be happy to start building that again and do um, maybe even DJ sets with the tracks. You remember when we were doing the label submissions video last week? And I sort, of just, I sort of just started building a DJ set. And I was like, oh, this one fits here, this one fits here. I would personally want to do a DJ set with the tracks that are coming towards a compilation because I think that would be fun. But that's kind of pre-publishing, like sneak release. So I'm not sure that's the best idea. But we have a lot of releases that came out in the past that we could DJ with. And um, it's going to be House and Techno. And DJ Waters, I don't know if I'm going to do a hardcore set with your tracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be fun, but it might be like a once in a while thing. So it's about 1230. I don't want this to be a super long thing. I'd like it to be useful. Did I answer any other? I think there was a question that I missed, right? Oh, Taib, would I buy Soothe 2 for 150 bucks? Um, well, no, because I don't know what it is, and I'm not really looking for new plugins and instruments. So I'm not going to comment on Soothe 2, but I might click in and explore it, or if you want to tell me more about what it does. Well, cool. Thanks for the feedback on um, DJ sets and streams. I'm glad that's something you guys want to see because I enjoy doing that. And I think I, set, I, think I, I think I described pretty much everything I'm doing in a DJ set. Um, all these controllers are knobs mapped to my effect unit from my little pad controller over here. So while I'm tweaking effects, I can just grab these knobs. And uh, I like these because they're not contiguous infinity controllers. So I can look at the knob and see the position of that filter or that device and keep it going. Whoa. All right. Um, if you have any other questions, type them in right now. <laughs> What's today, Thursday? Yeah. Oh, another question is, um, I have a question for you guys. Do you think that I should do live streams for DJing on YouTube or on Twitch? Because I know Twitch has its own audience and stuff. But YouTube is where a lot of our people are. Uh, Matt, I have the Akai LPD-8. I got two of these for live sets and the push, push two. So I'm using one LPD right now. That's for um, selecting what we're looking at, whether it's a track or an effects unit and controlling the effects. And then I'm basically using my push to launch tracks and get an overview of what's in the whole section or what's in each section for the whole set. So that's my tactile world. Both, was that both for YouTube and Twitch? Um, okay. I might go, I think I have to pick which one I go live. So I could do live to Twitch and then record and replay and post the, the video as a replay, like a podcast episode to SoundCloud and everything. And I know that um, all my favorite record labels put up mix sets from the DJs on that label. So I'm completely open to all you guys recording your sets, sharing them, with us and helping to promote those as uh, pushing, you know, DJs from our producers from the Mix of Texture crew who are doing DJ sets and mix sets. If that can help you get booked or help you get gigs or help you get other publishing or whatever, I'm all about doing that. Oh, that's right. Maxime, um, Max, shit. Yeah, YouTube is going to give me copyright strikes all over the place. That's a really good point. 
So I guess we're going to be doing streams to Twitch that I can record and post to SoundCloud. Yeah, Matt, we just... It's funny how this stuff is like, I knew all these things, but I sort of forgot at the time we we're talking about it. But yeah, the whole reason I was DJing on Twitch is because if you go live and you don't have the videos on demand, then you can um, you can play copyrighted tracks on Twitch and it doesn't get interrupted. So we could have live on Twitch, record it on the other board, and then um, repost them onto SoundCloud or MixCloud. So Max, what do you want to know about the Model 24? I have this Tascam Model 24 board and uh, we could do a live or a workshop on how I use that as an audio interface for mixing multi-track sounds or doing analog summing or something. So I wonder if it's, what happens if I move this camera? Okay, so there's the board down there and I could put this camera a lot closer down and show you like about the thing I was saying with the input selecting where you can have sounds coming in a cable on top or digitally from the SD card or from the Ableton outputs. And um, I could just basically take a session that I'm working on and split it out to analog and run through. There I am. Hey. Whoa, whoa. Would that help if we take like a multi track Ableton session, split out to the Model 24? I can show you all the analog channels, how I pick which sounds go on which channels, and how to make a mix that you record as a two track mix. Oh, question Is the control room a second master out? Yeah, you have, a, you have a separate volume knob for the control room outputs. So the control room is taking a copy of what's at the master left, right? So the signal is from the master left, right? And the jacks are getting a sound with a control room volume. So you could have, it's like headphones. For your, you could have your studio monitors plugged in the control room volume. And like traditionally recorders, the master left, right, go straight to the recording deck and your monitors are on the control room volume. So you can choose your control room monitoring loudness without messing up the master level of what's hitting the tape deck. Uh, when do you put hardware into two hard pan tracks or um, a balance track? Well, you <laughs> depends on how many channels you have. These are great questions. Let's make um let's make another Ask Me Anything poll, and we could put all the questions about analog mixers and audio interfaces in there, and then I could collect all those and answer that with a live stream. I think that would be fun. These are great questions, and they're all things that make a difference at one level or another. Uh, the ultimate answer is you know you use everything you have and do things in unconventional ways if you have to put like two a stereo channel into twin mono and hard pan it that's like a workaround for not having another stereo channel so sometimes it matters sometimes it doesn't ah uh, you're gonna have a hi-fi system in the bedroom oh in the control room <laughs> gotta get this track done too jamming all right so homework for steve is get some dj sets running prep a Model 24 or an analog audio interface mix lesson. This is that bass and drums dub out, right? Where are we in the set? Where am I in the track? Oh, I got this much left. I can tell by the effects it's almost time to mix. One, two, three, four. Oh, for example, a drum machine should be put on two tracks or one. Honestly, a lot of drum machines I would do one because it could be mono for kick and snare drum. If you're doing drum machines with samples that are stereo, then you use two. But uh, you could probably get away with a mono single channel drum machine for hi-hats, kick, snare, clap, hi-hat. That's pretty mono stuff. Yeah, you want to have your hi-fi stereo in the bedroom with your speakers positioned equally on the sides of the bed so both people can get beat matched. <laughs> what the hell is Steve doing? All right. Did y'all have a nice 420 yesterday? I went to a bar where my friend, my friend was DJing a bunch of reggae music 
at this like cocktail bar. It's like a fancy cocktail bar where people are getting like whiskeys and sushi and like nice food and stuff. And he's in the back like rocking reggae beats <laughs> with his speaker up in the air, like this janky cable hanging down. And we were just like in the back corner, like a little, like a separate DJ booth party. And then the place was full. It was jammed full and a lot of people got into the groove. So I was happy about that. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up for today. Um, as always, everybody, thanks for hanging out and asking questions and telling me what you want help with and telling me what to remember so I'm not stupid because <laughs> the stuff about Twitch and everything, gotta run through that again. But let's get some connections going, some DJ sets. And most importantly, anybody who's producing tracks, I think should be making mix sets to show how your tracks fit together, like Shepherds or Mark Troy or Matt Schultz. All you guys sort of do DJ a bit, but please do that some more. Long mixes are so great to listen to. And when you can hear the way a person's music fits into context of how they see it, you just get such a bigger picture of where their what their world's all about. So yeah, let's all let's get some DJ sets going that we can um, share and promote with each other. And that's gonna be it for now. Uh, maybe tomorrow night I might pop up and do a DJ mix, maybe. And then uh, Saturday we'll be on for a track feedback. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. I do love the effects. Always playing songs the wrong way. <laughs> wow, that sounds so cool. All right, y'all. See you later.